Good evening, everybody, or should I perhaps say good morning or good afternoon, depending on which part of the globe you're tuning in from to follow us. My name is Vuk Yeremich, and it gives me an immense pleasure to wish you a virtual welcome to Belgrade, the home of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, Southeast Europe's leading foreign policy think tank. Our goal, our mission, is to try and help public in the region and beyond make a better sense of what is going on in the world. The world which is arguably being shaken like never before in living memory. Uh, half of the planet's population is in lockdown, bringing the global economy to a virtual halt. For the first time in history, the price of oil in America is negative. Several leaders around the world have declared that we are at war, this time with an invisible enemy, COVID-19. Now, what is going on in the world? And perhaps more importantly, what will happen after the fog of war subsides and there is a new dawn on humanity? Uh, whose fault was this? Uh, was it anyone's fault? What are going to be the repercussions of this crisis on the most consequential relationship of our times, that between the United States and China? And what are going to be the repercussions on the world uh, from the trajectory of this relationship? Well, answers to this and many other questions um, are going to be given to us today by two uh, exceptional speakers, uh, real sages, uh, diplomatic grandees. Uh, the first one of them is my friend Ivo Dalder, a great American scholar and senior diplomat. He was educated at the universities of Kent, Georgetown and Oxford uh, before receiving his PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was a senior fellow uh, at the Harvard University and also at the Brookings Institution in Washington. He was also teaching at the University of Maryland. He was a White House director for Europe uh, at some point in his career. And he was also an advisor to the victorious campaign of President Barack Obama. Uh, he served as the American ambassador to the North Atlantic Council and is currently the president of one of U.S. most influential think tanks, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He's a prolific author of many books, the last one being The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. My second interlocutor today is Kishore Mabubani, the legend of multilateral diplomacy and one of the great sages of Asia. He was an advisor to Lee Kuan Yew and after spending decades building one of the most competent diplomatic services in the world, received the Gold Public Administration Medal of the Republic of Singapore. He was the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Financial Times, Foreign Policy, and The Prospect magazine place him on the list of the top global thinkers of today, together with the likes of Pope Francis, Elon Musk, and Amartya Sen. He's an author of many books on Asia and the world, The Great Convergence, was uh, translated into dozens of languages, including Serbian. And it gives me a great pleasure to say that it was the CIRSD who was the publisher of Kishore's great book, now a diplomacy textbook um, in Serbia. His latest book is titled in a very provocative way, Has China Won? Uh, it happens to be also the cover page of the last issue of The Economist. So this book was written before the COVID 
19 crisis. Now, thank you guys for joining. It's a great pleasure to have you. And uh, allow me to ask the first question to Kishore without revealing the content of his book. So we're not gonna reveal the content of the book. We're not gonna say uh, whether China has won or hasn't won, according to Kishore. But the COVID-19 happened. Now, what is your opinion, Kishore, after COVID-19? Is China likelier to win or not in comparison to before? And what does winning mean to begin with? Hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me on the show. It's such a pleasure to be with you, Vuk, and with Ivo, with whom I just did another program uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I think the correct term you use, Vuk, is that we are still surrounded by the fog of war. I think COVID-19 is proving to be far more dangerous and far more difficult to handle than I think anybody anticipated. So for example, even Singapore, uh, which should be relatively well prepared for something like this, is really struggling still uh, with COVID-19. And I think it will be premature for any country uh, to declare any kind of victory against this virus because it's very, very unlike the other viruses. But nonetheless, if you ask as of now, uh, which countries are doing well, it's countries like China, uh, South Korea, to some extent Singapore, if you leave aside the foreign worker problem, or you think societies like uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan have done well too. So it's clear that there's a certain degree of competence in government institutions uh, that has been developed in East Asia, uh, including China. And that competence is showing itself and manifesting itself in the way it's handling uh, this crisis. And in the case of China, I think it reflects a very, very deep investment on the part of the state, on the part of the state to recruit the best and brightest uh, of the society to work in the government organs. So you see the quality of mind of people who are, let's say, deployed in the health services or uh, other important state agencies has never been higher uh, in, in China. So that, that I think, show, what, what this crisis has shown uh, is some of the deeper strengths uh, that China has developed. And it shows that perhaps it would be a mistake to underestimate uh, what China can do. It would be safer to overestimate what China can do in the coming decades. Well, thank you, Kishore. Uh, and what's your take, uh, Ivo, uh, on the title of Kishore's book, or perhaps on the front page of The Economist saying, is China winning? Is China winning these days? And uh, how does it look from an American lens? Well, first of all, Vuk, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. And Kishore, it's great to uh, to be with you again. It, it seems like, on the one hand, we can't meet in person, uh, uh, even our neighbors across the street, but we seem to be able to meet very frequently online. So uh, the one benefit, I guess, of, uh, of this crisis. So it's great to see you again, Kishore, uh, as well. Uh, I, I, I agree with, uh, with Kishore's uh, big point. Uh, which is that there is one thing that has been consistent in this crisis, which is that we have underestimated its severity. And I think when I say we, I think that it's truly everyone, with very, very, very few exceptions. Uh, perhaps Taiwan and uh, and Singapore, because they lived through the SARS crisis, uh, were able to act uh, a little uh, sooner, and as a result, were able to prevent. Uh, the, the very worst from happening. Other countries have learned from uh, the mistakes uh, that uh, uh, others have made. So I'm thinking here of New Zealand and Australia uh, that took very early action and, and were able, uh, in the case of New Zealand, perhaps being the first country to eradicate uh, the disease from, uh, from the two islands. Um, uh, but uh, overall, uh, I think the Chinese underestimated it in December and early January. 
uh, and everyone else continues to underestimate I think, the long-term um, damage that uh, COVID-19 is doing to, to the global order in two fundamental ways. One, this disease is going to be with us for a lot longer than people seem to think. Uh, this whole idea that we are reopening the economies, that things will soon go back to normal, whether that's true in China or anywhere else, we're finding that once you reopen, uh, the, the disease just comes back. It's happening in China, it's happening in Singapore. Uh, it will no doubt happen in Europe and, and the United States uh, when things change there. Uh, secondly, we haven't even seen the worst of it. Uh, we may have seen uh, uh, some peaking in certain parts of the world, but much of the world uh, is at the beginning uh, of this crisis in Africa, uh, throughout Latin America and South Asia. Um, we will see uh, a lot going uh, that is that that will be worse and as a result thirdly the economic uh, rebound is just going to take a lot of time it's not this is not a v-shaped depression uh, it is a w or multi w uh, uh, depression all of which then asks the question what is the impact of this on the global order and the only quite answer i can give to that it is way too early uh, to come to the conclusion of who is winning, uh, who will have won, and more and equally importantly, who has lost. What I can say uh, today is that uh, China is still in a position over time to come out of this uh, on top. Uh, the United States is still in a position together with its allies to come out on top. And the question is how are both countries uh, leading internationally in order to find out where we're moving. We're not, we haven't decided this yet. I think uh, Kishore's book quite rightly still has a question mark in the title. Uh, and, and as a result, I think uh, we, we will uh, take some time to decide how are both countries managing this crisis? How would they seem to be managing the crisis? And as a result, to see who comes out uh, with the best, uh, uh, the best advantage. As a very quick follow-up to that, Ivo, uh, this is probably the third big crisis of this century. The first one being the 9-11 and the second one being the 2008 Great Financial Crisis. But unlike in the first two, where America was clearly center and front in addressing uh, the consequences, and some would agree and some would disagree with whether this was the best way around it, but America was undoubtedly in the driving seat. And today it doesn't seem so. Uh, why, first of all, am I right in saying this? And, 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 and why is this the case? Yeah, you're clearly right. And I, I, would, uh, I, I would argue that this is the worst crisis since World War II. It is incomparably greater uh, than 9-11 and the, and the financial crisis. Uh, or indeed any other crisis we have uh, seen uh, since since World War II. Uh, and the defining aspect of World War II uh, is twofold. One, the absence of the United States at the start of that war. Uh, it was nowhere to be found. It was not part of the conflict. Uh, it did not declare war on Germany in 1939 as France and, and, and Britain did. Indeed, it was not part of the war until it was attacked uh, by the Japanese in Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. So the absence of the United States led to a worldwide conflagration that led to a war uh, uh, that even today stands as unique in, 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 in world history. The second aspect of World War II was the presence of the United States, the leadership of the United States, that once it did engage, it engaged fully, completely, and totally in terms of its economic potential to uh, create what Roosevelt called the arsenal of, of democracy, and of course, by winning fundamentally the war, uh, first in Europe and then in the Pacific. And uh, coming out of that war as the unquestioned global leader that then created an international order uh, that uh, for much of the, uh, of the 20th century extended only to the Western world, but the Western world was pretty large, in which the United States created security institutions, open economic uh, systems and uh, and promoted uh, democracy, freedom, and human rights, uh, and did so as a self-declared but well-accepted leader of the free world. And that has been the dominant trend of American foreign policy and global engagement for the last 70 years. Uh, it's absent, as you note, uh, today in a way that is uh, remarkable 
uh, by uh, uh, its absence. We do not see the United States leading international institutions, whether it's Western institutions like the G7, global institutions like the United Nations and the G20, um, uh, uh, or, or any other institutions. Indeed, we see the United States focused solely and completely on uh, securing supply and capabilities to ensure its own citizens and its own people uh, are, are protected without regard of the rest of the world. Uh, and as America first policy, as President Trump uh, enunciated during the campaign and has, has uh, pursued ever since, uh, is a direct, um, uh, stands in direct contrast to 70 years of American leadership. And indeed, that the book uh, that I wrote with Jim Lindsay, The Empty Throne, is about that application of global leadership and its consequences. And I think we're seeing it today. Well, thank you, uh, Ivo. Uh, sure, uh, I'm going to get back to you now. Uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion these days in, uh, in global media, in the halls of power, uh, in the street, uh, with this absence of American leadership, uh, China's presence seems uh, far more visible, if you will, than it was before. And there's this uh, uh, number of conflicting views as to what China wants. And when I say what China wants, uh, let, me, let me try to focus it a little bit more. Uh, how would you describe, in simple terms, what is it that China's leadership wants before as well as now in the midst of this crisis? What are the strategic goals of uh, the Chinese government? In your view, well, uh, let me let me let me begin first of all by saying I completely agree with uh, what Ivo just said about the very important leadership role that the United States has played in the world over seventy years, and the uh, most important thing that the United States gifted to the world was the nineteen forty five rules based order, and that rules based order basically facilitated the rise of East Asia and also the rise of China. So, uh, and I agree with Ivo, it's a pity that we don't see this leadership today. Now, the question therefore arises, uh, can China step in and, and play their role? And what, what are China's goals? And I think it's important to understand that, to understand China's goals, you must understand China's history. And from the Chinese, see, the, the, when the Americans took on the leadership role, at the end of the World War II, they were doing so in the middle of the American century when everything had gone right in America for uh, almost a hundred years, you know. And so America was becoming stronger and stronger and stronger with decade after decade. China, by contrast, what, what is etched in the Chinese minds is the hundred years of humiliation that they suffered from 1842 to 1949, the Opium War, the seizure of Chinese territories, the sacking of the Summer Palace, the reparations that the Chinese had to pay. So the Chinese discovered that when they were weak, the, West, the whole world, especially the West, trampled on China and the Chinese people suffered a lot. So if you want to, if you want to answer your question, uh, but what are China's strategic goals? This, it can be captured in two words, which is never again. Never again will China allow itself to be weak and trampled by the rest of the world. So the primary goal is to make China as strong as possible. But of course, the Chinese have also in the process asked themselves, well, why did they become so weak? How could the world trample on them? And one answer they came to was that the reason why they became so weak is because they cut themselves off from the world. They isolated themselves and they didn't understand the world had changed. So to, today, the second strategic goal of the Chinese is we must remain globally engaged. So at a time when the United States, in, let's say, is retreating from free trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China is still advancing towards free trade agreements because China understands that global engagement is very important. So from the Chinese point of view, they actually want to maintain this 1945 rules-based order 
because that has facilitated their rise. But the question then, the next question is, can they then provide the leadership to manage these institutions? And that's where, for the Chinese, is actually very difficult. The Chinese, unlike the United States, the United States of America has a kind of a universalizing mission that believes that the whole world can become like and become American like America. The Chinese believe that only the Chinese can become Chinese. <laughs> they don't believe that anybody else can become Chinese. So they want to see a strong China. They want to cooperate with the rest of the world. But I think they're not yet ready to provide the kind of leadership in the way that the Americans did in the past. So the, I believe that the Chinese are ready to cooperate with the rest of the world. They are prepared to work with, for example, in G20 and in the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, China played a very critical role in trying to save uh, the world from a financial crisis that was created actually, as you know, by the Lehman Brothers crisis. The Chinese said, it doesn't matter who created it. What matters is that we, the whole world is suffering. We must come together and solve it. So I would say what we need to do therefore is to use the current institutions including, by the way, the World Health Organization and strengthen these organizations and work with China in these organizations. Uh, Eva, would you agree with that? Uh, how would you define what are the goals of China viewed from an American perspective? Uh, I think we are still seeing the evolution. I think Kishore gives a, uh, a, a view that I think is, is perfectly plausible. Uh, certainly on the first issue of never again assuming there is the humiliation and secondly uh, to have a global engagement uh, that uh, that is based on some concept of order and I guess the real question is what's that concept uh, and, and and just maybe to, to highlight a potential difference that I think Kishore is also highlighting between how the United States opted to, to lead in the world and how China is looking at that issue. Uh, remember that the U.S., although it had been thinking through World War II about how to organize the global order, uh, really was pulled in, uh, in a wonderful phrase, it was an empire by invitation. There were a lot of countries that were extraordinarily weak after World War II, who faced, particularly in Europe, but also in other parts of the world, with the possibility of, uh, of a revolutionary uh, Soviet Union. Uh, wanted to be protected uh, and wanted to have a, 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 a way to be part of an international system that was U.S.-led. And the desire for U.S. leadership was very high in 45. And in many ways continues up to this very day. There is a, a hunkering for an America that is willing and able to lead in not just the universalizing mission that, that Kishore talks about, but in this fundamental way of bringing countries together building and strengthening and maintaining institutions to deal with common problems. Uh, and um, uh, China doesn't have that capability, in part because a lot of people don't trust China. Uh, they're worried that the Chinese uh, uh, interest isn't in building a global system that provides for public goods that are uh, available for everyone. They're worried that China is going to use the historical parallel of all other uh, hegemonic powers, which is to take to to can maintain power by 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 brute force or by the overwhelming economic and military power that it, that it possesses. Uh, there's hardly anyone who is inviting China to take uh, a leadership role, uh, uh, other than the fact that the United States is not fulfilling it. And so this question of how these two powers are going to deal with the issue of how one leads. Uh, is is particularly uh, important. I think the reason that China has a larger role to play today is because the United States no longer plays it. Nature abhors a vacuum. The Chinese are by, by far the most important power in the world aside from the United States, and they have stepped in. Uh, we are seeing some of the reaction to that. We're seeing that in Europe, we're seeing that in other places uh, where the reaction is, well, you know, one, not so fast, and two, it's not really clear that you have our interests uh, at heart, and that's true on the Huawei uh, and 5G questions. It's true on 
uh, economic investment uh, uh, and, and trade questions. It's true on the BRI and the, the Belt and Road Initiative. There is a debate within every society, including yours, uh, uh, um, Fook, uh, about the relative interest of, the, uh, of China. Uh, and there's a huge debate here in the United States. Uh, where many are seeing China, are looking at China as a zero sum power rather than a positive sum power um, in terms of who is getting the most uh, uh, ability to, to use engagement to its own benefit. Well, uh, very interesting. Kishore, um, Ivo mentioned Huawei, and this is one of the big uh, topics in, for example, the tech world. Uh, whether we are now witnessing the beginning of bifurcation of the decoupling of uh, technological ecosystems of China in the West. For the time being, it doesn't seem like uh, the West is very comfortable with letting in Huawei. China is definitely not comfortable with letting in uh, companies like uh, Google uh, or Amazon or, or Facebook into China. Uh, people are now starting to talk about separate uh, clouds, uh, separate AI development, and uh, there are some people wondering if uh, this trajectory is reversible. Are we going to see the continuation of technological decoupling leading to a decoupling of supply chains, leading to two separate, uh, almost uh, uh, totally exclusive economic systems and ultimately Cold War. Are we moving along this trajectory at this moment? What do you think? Well, I think maybe my role is to cheer up everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't see a, a dark future ahead for us because I think it's also important and I, what do you, I completely agree with Evo that uh, in 1945, uh, the world was such a distraught place in many ways. A major world war, the rest of the world, including Singapore, India, were still all colonies. So it was a dark and depressing world in 1945. And, and America's willingness to help the world was like a shining light for the world at that time in 1945. But uh, we are now 75 years later, and in, we are now in 2020. It's a very different world today. And you have countries that are much more self-confident, uh, aware of what they can do, and willing to make their own judgments of what is good for them. And as I say in the chapters of one of my book, uh, has China won, that you know, if you have 330 million people in uh, America, 1.4 billion in China, you still have almost 6 billion people outside in the rest of the world. And these 6 billion people are going to choose very carefully. And I can confidently make a prediction that let's say if tomorrow the United States decided to say, okay, I'm going to uh, have another Cold War this time against China and I'm going to start a containment policy, well, will you all please join in? I would say the number of countries who joined enthusiastically the first Cold War in 1949, you won't get the same kind of number of countries joining in 2020. Because at the end of the day, what all the countries in the world want is they want to work with the United States with the strengths that the United States has, and they want to work with China uh, with the strengths that uh, China has. And the big message from virtually most of the countries that I speak to nowadays is, don't force us to choose. We will work with you on issues that we think you and I can cooperate and we'll both benefit. And we will work with China on issues where we can uh, cooperate. And you know, if, if you look at it in practical terms, over 100 countries today do far more trade with China than they do uh, with the United States. And from, from, from many countries' uh, point of view, in practical terms, if you, if you are literally looking for good infrastructure, you're looking for a good road, uh, a good fast train, a good port, um, and a good telecommunication system, you find that the package that China is offering to you 
at the end of the day is beneficial for you and so you accept it right and that's why that's why you know you can't for example you know you take the belt and road initiative which i think you also mentioned countries are free to join or not to join so japan doesn't join which is understandable india doesn't join also understandable because of their problems with the china pakistan economic corridor but the vast majority of countries are joining including european countries like italy greece and so on and so forth so it is a different world. So what I would say in this world, uh, the, the best thing that the United States and China could do is not force countries to choose one or the other, but to work with the countries in the areas where they can work and cooperate together. And most countries in the world want to have good relations with the US and good relations with China. Well, thanks, Kishore, for being this positive. But uh, as you know, not everybody shares this view uh, for example uh it was uh it was famously said in munich it was a few months ago at the munich security conference i know that evo evo was uh, was attending it there was a meeting between uh u.s senators uh, led by senator lindsey graham and the chiefs of german companies in which uh lindsey graham said quite literally uh, if you allow uh, Huawei into your technological ecosystem, you are going to have us as enemy. That sounds like America is about to force upon a choice, uh, at least on its closed uh, allies. So what's your take on this, Ivo? So I, uh, I, I, I agree and disagree with, with Kishore. I agree fundamentally that if uh, the United States behaves in the way that you are describing as it behaved in, uh, in Munich, uh, we're going to lose uh, the, the trade-off between what China has on offer and what the United States has on offer. But what the United States has on offer is a whole lot more than don't buy Huawei. Uh, what the United States can have on offer is a still the capacity to corral large parts of the world towards common action to deal with the major problems of the day. And uh, I do think that there are areas in which, of course, the United States needs to cooperate with China. I'm thinking about climate, certainly COVID-19 is one of those areas where the absence of cooperation hurts both of our, uh, our countries and, uh, and, uh, and parts. But there are others in which we will need to compete. And the way we compete uh, is not through military competition or a new Cold War in a sort of zero-sum way. The way we compete is the way we've always comp competed. That is to provide a, uh, and lead a global order that emphasizes the importance of strong security ties to make sure that no one challenges uh, the territorial, political uh, integrity and political independence uh, of countries and that's one of the issues that is at stake in the South China Sea, uh, where we build an open economic system, one in which we abide by the rules. And if there are, if, if, if there are um, violations of those rules, we go to the international institutions that exist uh, to deal with them in the trade case of the WTO. And if we don't like the way the WTO is ma being managed, we help reform it, uh, not abandon it. Uh, that we do the same when it comes to the questions of human rights uh, and, and democracy and freedom. Uh, and that we band together to make sure that countries, uh, they don't have to accept our political uh, system. Our political choices are ones that we made at home. But that if you violate fundamental human rights, as the Chinese are clearly doing in, uh, in, in parts of, its own, of their own country, or are uh, building an internet or a, 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 a uh, cyber infrastructure that bans uh, whole parts of, uh, of the internet, that there are going to be consequences. But the way to do that is by building coalitions, by building strong, capable coalitions in order to provide a counterbalance and an incentive for other countries, starting with the Chinese, to play by the rules. Uh, and if the rules need to be changed to accommodate a rising China, you do that. Uh, through negotiations, as indeed we've done in, 
in, in the IMF and uh, should have done in the IMF uh, and World Bank. So I think there is a cooperative order, but that order has to be based on a confident uh, leadership uh, by the United States. But that leadership means you have followership. You have countries who come with you and not divide the world into our sphere versus their sphere. And if you're with them, then you're not with us. This you're either with us or with against us may have worked in the after 9-11 when it comes to terrorism. It's not a particularly good way to deal with international mm -hmm. policy. Can I just chip in one small uh, point? Here? Oops, sure, can absolutely. I just chip in yeah, you know, uh, uh, in my book, I, I, I talk about uh, George Kennan and the advice he gave to America as it embarked on its major Cold War against the Soviet Union. And it's interesting, he gave four pieces of advice. He said, the most important thing is to maintain a spiritual vitality at home. It's the strength of your domestic order that ultimately is what's going to attract the rest of the world to you. Number two, cultivate friends and allies. Number three, don't insult countries. And you don't, you don't even insult the Soviet Union because at the end of the day, we have to deal with them. Number four, be humble. And what's interesting is that these pieces of advice that George Cannon gave in 1949 are still valid today. That these are the, this is the way you deal with a big adversary and not try to do all the kinds of things that are going on today. Because I, I must say the one thing that worries me is that there is now a freedom to insult China. You can say anything you want against China. It's a sort of license to insult. And I think that's wrong. I mean, you may disagree with China, you may disagree with many things that they're doing, but at the end of the day, they're also still an old civilization. And the Chinese are very proud of their civilization. And the Chinese have now reached a point, and this is something that I wish somebody would try and explain to America. They're, they're tired of these insults, very, very tired. And, and what my big fear is that, is that the more you insult them, you get the result that George Cannon anticipated in his 1949 advice. You then deal with an irrational adversary rather than a rational one that you can deal with. That's very interesting. And that actually leads me well to my next question. Uh, in your book, uh, Has China Won? You have an imaginary memo written to President Xi Jinping by a member of Politburo advising the president what to do. Uh, but that was before COVID-19. It was before this escalation. Now, I'm going to ask you uh, to imagine yourself being the national security mm -hmm. advisor of Xi Jinping and having to write a one-page memo with up to three recommendations, three things that you, the national security advisor to President Xi Jinping, would recommend that Xi Jinping should do now. What would that be? Well, as you know, uh, uh, the main point of my the memo in my book to Xi Jinping was, whatever you do, don't underestimate the United States of America. It's a remarkable country. So that was the main point of that memo to Xi Jinping. And today, I would say the three priorities, if I was the national security advisor, Xi Jinping, the three priorities that China must do today, clearly, number one, it's got to kill COVID-19. That's got to be the total national effort. And clearly, if the Chinese scientists can find the right vaccine or the right antidote to it, that would be amazing. That's what the world will want to do. See, the number two, I would say this crisis has given China a huge opportunity because there are countries around the world that are struggling to find masks, uh, personal protection equipment, ventilators. And, you know, as you know, at the end of uh, World War II, America had this incredible industrial capacity, incredible. Today, that same industrial capacity is what you find in China. And the Chinese can produce this stuff at a remarkable rate and send and they're exporting, I don't know, hundreds of millions of masks every day now. So, so that, that's what they should be doing. And the third thing, of course, I would, this is a very critical point that we should, China should adopt the World Health Organization and once again make it a very strong and 
powerful organization because you know as you know in the book the great convergence i explained that the west made a big mistake in cutting down the mandatory contribution to the world health organization from 62 percent to 18 percent so the who can only rely on one fifth of its budget four fifths is voluntary it keeps bouncing up and down the mandatory portion of the budget must be pushed up so that the world health organization can recruit scientists health inspectors all the staff you need to deal with the next pandemic so invest in it now and china can say okay i will invest in the who and get the best doctors from all over the world to come and work in the who to make sure that next time this pandemic happens we will have a stronger who rather than a weaker who that is fascinating thank you i'm going to ask a very similar question to evo but it's going to be more difficult because it is going to take a little bit more imagination uh, i know evo that uh, you are not in the top five admirers let me put it this way of donald trump but i know that you are a great american patriot so uh, imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning and uh, somehow you realize that uh, you woke up in Washington and that you are the national security advisor of Donald J. Trump. And you are asked exactly what I asked Kishore to write a one page memo with up to three recommendations to President Donald J. Trump. What would those recommendations be? Uh, so you're you're right. That's not very likely to ever happen. Uh, as a uh, as a part of uh, uh, current political alignments, and and so let me let me say that the the memo I'd write is the same memo I'd write to any president, uh, and I and they're not that different, although they're different tonally than I think Kishore's uh, memo to Xi. Uh, number one is I I, I think uh, finding a way to unite the nation uh, behind the fight against COVID nineteen is absolutely critical uh, and the one uh, it's critical for two reasons one is the only way to actually succeed uh, we will not succeed uh, in the way that we have been uh, dealing with this uh, crisis in the past three or four months which is to say that there are 50 states and god knows how many municipalities and they can all figure it out it needs a united effort directed from the center by the federal government led by the president of the united states and in order to do that, you need to take, make some tough decisions and most importantly, take responsibility uh, for the outcome. Uh, and so uh, uh, getting that process right so that you can then marshal the great unlimited and unheard of resources that the United States still possesses to deal with this uh, crisis is extremely important. One, in order to deal with the disease, but two, in order to send the message to the rest of the world that the United States remains a competent, capable uh, country to deal with a crisis like this. And right now, that's not the message that's being sent. Number two, uh, it means uh, going out and reminding oneself and one's friends and allies who are friends and allies, and to bring together the great friends and allies we have in North America, in Europe, and in Asia, in a constructive uh, uh, effort to rebuild uh, a rules-based global international order that is fundamentally based on the three pillars of common security, open and free economics, and, st and strong uh, democracy and human rights and freedom. And to rebuild that friendship and alliances that we can with our friends in, in, in Asia, uh, with our friends in Europe, with our friends in, in uh, North America and indeed in South America, and, and once again become this global leader that deals with global problems in an effective way. And then third, uh, I think it is extraordinarily important that we rebuild the global institutions that truly matter for managing uh, what's happening. Starting, I think rightly, as, as Kishore said, the WHO, which needs more funding and, and indeed more independence uh, to be able to act uh, as a uh, guardian of public health rather than as a uh, instrument of the most powerful. And one of the reason I would be worried about a China pushing uh, to uh, become the lead 
funder and enabler of the WHO is because I don't think that China always puts public health uh, beyond uh, first. And indeed, its decision to continue to bar Taiwan uh, from uh, the WHO's uh, engagement is a is a one driven by politics and not by public health. It was after all the Taiwanese who were the first to uh, warn uh, the WHO of what was happening in uh, in, in Wuhan, uh, and and again has demonstrated an ability to deal with the disease that is enviable by 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 any standards. But I would go beyond the WHO. I think we need to rebuild the WTO. Uh, I think we need to have a trading organization that is strong, capable, and has the 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 the, in, the enforcement mechanisms that, frankly, the U.S. Uh, has has undermined. I think we need to reform the United Nations. Uh, I think we need to uh, have a system that is no longer the, the legacy of World War II, but is the predecessor of what a 21st century security architecture looks like. And, and this in other ways, I think what we need is an America that is again interested, and this is by bottom line, in leading rather than winning. There's a fundamental difference between the two. Winning you do by beating somebody else. Leading you do by getting others to come with you. And we have been leading for 75 years. Uh, and, and recently we have traded that for winning. Winning is zero sum. Leading is positive sum. And the way we're going to deal with this world is to understand that if you insist on winning, you're going to lose. You both of you are obviously devout multilateralist. And so am I. So I just wish that I had you, Ivo, as American ambassador and you, Kishore, as the Chinese ambassador to the UN at the time when I was president <laughs> of the General Assembly. But maybe one day uh, this kind of thinking is going to prevail. I'm very hopeful uh, that this is going to be the case. Uh, this was my last I hope Kishore uh, will remain the Singapore <laughs> ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to now go to the, to the last portion of my questions before going to uh, some of the questions given to us by our audience. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, simple, quick block. It's called the Blitz questions. You are allowed only to give a yes or a no answer. So it means that uh, we don't take it depends. We don't take, uh, well, uh, the, I don't know, and it's hard to tell. You're essentially uh, asked to make an educated guess or a bet about the following. It's the year 2025, and the 5G networks have been rolled out in the whole of the world. Now, we mentioned Huawei before, so it's a big... Uh, issue it's a controversial issue so i'm going to ask you a question whether the following country in 2025 is going to have in your opinion huawei built into their 5g systems yes or a no and i'm going to start by kishore asking him about india uh yes Evo, Pakistan. Yes. Uh, Kishore, South Korea. Yes. Evo, Italy. <coughs> no. Kishore, Japan. No. Evo, Turkey. Kishore, Brazil. No. Evo, Hungary. Yes. Kishore, the United Arab Emirates. Yes. Evo, Mexico. Yes. Kishore, Singapore. Yes. Evo, Singapore. Yes. Kishore, Serbia. Yes. Evo, Serbia. Yes. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, Kishore is slightly more bullish on Huawei, but it was a fascinating exchange. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, now, if you allow me, I'm going to ask you a few very interesting questions that came from uh, our followers and members of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. Try to be as succinct as possible so that we can answer as many questions as possible. We have 10 more minutes uh, for our conversation. Uh, the first question is for Kishore, and that's from Sinisha from Belgrade. Uh, he's asking you, is the Communist Party of China really popular in China? And if it is popular, what's the reason for their popularity? Well, uh, I think the problem in understanding the Chinese Communist Party is the name. It's called the Chinese Communist Party. And yet we know that China is not no longer exporting communism. I think once you understand that the people of China see the CCP as the Chinese civilization party, as the party that is once again strengthening China, making China a strong civilization, making China a respected country in the world, and, and the, 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 the CCP has delivered in the last 40 years a far greater improvement uh, in the standard of living of the Chinese people that the Chinese have enjoyed in the last 4,000 years. So having experienced this dramatic improvement in the standard of living of the people and, has, and, and seeing how respected China is internationally, that's why the CCP is popular still in China. Thank you. Uh, now question for Ivo from Alexander from Banya Luka. Uh, Senator Cotton from Arkansas and, Repub and Representative uh, Crenshaw from Texas uh, introduced a bill last week that would allow Americans to sue China in federal court in the United States for death, injury, and economic harm caused by the Wuhan virus. Is that going to become law, in your opinion? And if it does become a law, what would that practically mean? Uh, I think it's uh, very doubtful that uh, something like this comes uh, becomes law. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, the virus originated from uh, China, uh, but it's not a Chinese virus. Uh, the virus doesn't have a passport. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it crosses borders uh, in human beings who can be human beings from any of the seven point some billion people that we have, uh, and that's why this is a global pandemic. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that China made. Uh, early mistakes in treating the disease. It underestimated the extent of the disease. Uh, it, uh, it hid uh, information about it for too long. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, the disease was able to uh, spread globally. But even if China had acted with all of the foresight and with all of the transparency, uh, it is highly likely that this global disease would have spread globally. And every country does have a responsibility, first and foremost, uh, to deal with this question uh, and the, the threat that the, uh, the public health threat that the, uh, the virus causes. Uh, and, and the United States failure to do so is not because of what the Chinese did, it's because of what Americans did. Uh, and the success in countries like uh, Taiwan and, and New Zealand is because of what the Taiwanese did and the New Zealanders did. So, I don't see this as something that uh, should be litigated in the court of law, uh, nor do I think that uh, reparations are uh, the responsibility of a single uh, of a single country uh, versus everyone else. This is why I don't like the war metaphor. The war metaphor assumes that there is a, a, a initiator of conflict. Uh, and in this case, the initiator of conflict is not a country, it's a virus. Thank you, Ivo. Uh... Katerina from Novi Sad, the question for Kishore. Is China ever going to accept an international independent investigation into what really happened in Wuhan? Well, I think uh, a lot will depend on how this uh, investigation is framed. So is it perceived to be a hostile effort 
on the basis of legislation, say, passed in the U.S. Senate to try and embarrass China? Of course, China will say no. But if you can assemble a group of independent scientists that are internationally respected, that China respects and so on and so forth, and you put together a team of international scientists, uh, I think the Chinese would welcome such an investigation because they themselves realize how, how, how dangerous and how formidable this, this virus is. I think what, what people don't seem to understand is that we were, we were always very frightened of Ebola, we were frightened of SARS. But this is actually something far worse because it can actually uh, infect people even though you yourself may have no symptoms at all. You may look perfectly fine, but there you are going around infecting a lot of people. So it's a much more dangerous and much more tricky virus to handle. So this is where really all the investments in science we made in all these years, we should be pooling the scientists and bringing them together to deal with this. And if that's what the effort is, I think China would welcome it. Thank you, Kishore. That is really interesting. Uh, I got to ask you this question and it's got to go to both because it was such a such a brilliant way to start a question. Uh, and I know it's it's uh, it's a difficult one to answer, but uh, Vladimir from Krushevets, it's a town in central Serbia. Uh, he says uh, to quote the Yogi Bira, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. But if you were to place a bet today, uh, regardless of your uh, personal political uh, sentiment, who do you think will be elected in November as president of the United States? Uh, you want me to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I think Joe Biden. I didn't want to press. I, I, I can I see you know Biden more about America be... than I do. <laughs> and what do like you think, I said, I think, I think Joe Biden will be president. And you, Kishore? Uh, I, I be Joe Biden. Wow. That is very, very interesting. We're but definitely anyway, going to meet I when, I in, when, I, when I, I should mention when I was in Davos in January this year, Everyone thought that Trump would be the next president. <laughs> so and now, and now uh, uh, in only a few short months, everything uh, went uh, upside down. And uh, the last question uh, for um, Kishore is uh, from uh, Angela from Niche. She's asking, if China wins, is it going to behave like America, for whatever it means. Uh, I think um, I, I'm glad that uh, uh, Evo made the distinction between winning and leading. And I think that's a very critical distinction. And I actually conclude my book by saying that the real test about this question is not about whether China wins or whether America wins, but whether humanity wins as a result. Because right now, what we are facing are some remarkable global challenges. And I wrote this before COVID-19, I was thinking of global warming. I said, if the US and China keep fighting while global warming is happening, future generations will see them as two tribes of apes fighting each other while the forest around them was burning. So at the end of the day, if you want to focus on winning, we should focus on how we ensure that humanity wins at the end of the day. And that's what we should try to do with both US and China. Thanks, Kishore. And the last, last question of this conversation goes to uh, Ivo. Uh, it's from Ivana from Novi Sad, Ambassador Delder. What is your message for the people of Serbia? My message to people of Serbia is to remember that you're European. You live in Europe, you're part of Europe. Uh, and as a result, trying to find a way to work with all of your neighbors as part of a greater Europe 
uh, to take the kinds of decisions that allow uh, Serbia to be part of Europe, uh, in the end, part of the European Union, uh, which is a critical institution in Europe, is where the future of Serbia lies. Uh, and I very much hope that the, the people of Serbia uh, take that, that message to heart to remind themselves every day that, yes, you are Serbian, but you are also European. Well, thank you very much to both of you gentlemen. It was really a fascinating uh, and a humbling experience talking to the great sages of America and Asia. Uh, thank you for being positive. You are guys one of the more positive uh, interlocutors that I've had uh, during these uh, Corona dialogues. Uh, let us hope that the administrations uh, and the power capitals of the world will heed to your advice and that after this crisis, uh, after this crisis humbled us all and reminded us of how re reliant we are, uh, how reliant we are on each other and how the world is, after all, a very small and very interconnected place. Let us hope that this knowledge are going to bring us not to uh, more confrontation and more rivalry, but to more cooperation uh, in the 21st century. Thank you once again. Thank you for joining from Singapore and from Chicago. Thank you for being the guests of Belgrade. Uh, Kishore was a guest of Belgrade once physically. Uh, Evo hasn't yet uh, of the CIRSD. You have an invitation to come and perhaps repeat this kind of conversation in vivo once COVID-19 is history. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. My pleasure. Goodbye. Good to see you. Thank the you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye. Bye-bye.